Well, can I encourage you now to turn to the Word of God? It's page 20 in the New Testament. Page 20 to Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16. As Brett said, we've been in the series, People Jesus Met, and let's see who Christ meets today. These are just beautiful encounters. Every week as I study somebody new, I just marvel at the beauty of our Lord, uh, how he just treated people as individuals, and I don't think there was any cookie-cutter approach in terms of how he dealt with people in their hearts. So Matthew chapter 19 from verse 16, I'm not going to read the whole passage. It's page 20 in the New Testament. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones? The man inquired. Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go. Sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad, because he had great wealth. And then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? May God bless the reading of his word to us this morning. Well, what do we know about the man that Jesus meets today? Well, Matthew in his account tells us that he was young. That means he probably had time on his side, he was healthy, a picture of life. Luke in his account tells us that this man was a ruler. So he has influence on his side. He maybe was some kind of CEO of the day. And then Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of those gospel writers tell us that he was wealthy, which means he had riches and resources on his side. So he's known as the rich young ruler. And I think he'd probably blend right in with any of our yuppies up the road here in Santon. So he's got financial wealth, but he's also got great moral wealth. He's the kind of guy that we'd love to hang around. He's the kind of guy that we'd love to welcome into membership at RUC. He's the kind of guy we'd like to have round our home for a bride and maybe marry off our daughters to him. He seems to have it all. And he's even sensitive enough to come to Jesus in verse 20 uh, because he notices that he's got some kind of lack in his life. Something is missing and he just can't put his finger on. So he comes in verse 20 and he asks, what do I still lack? He recognizes something is, is missing, but are you ready for the punchline? Jesus sends him packing. Jesus shows him that he is outside the kingdom of God and you are probably as shocked as the disciples were. The scriptures tell us they were greatly astonished and then they're saying to themselves, if this guy who has it all together morally, financially, he's such a great guy, if he's outside of the kingdom of God, then who on earth is in? Who then can be saved? But the thing we need to realize is that Christianity is radically different, completely different from anything that you and I could ever concoct. And that's why we need to continue to revel in the gospel because the gospel can get old. We can be familiar with it. But the gospel is something radical that no human being could ever have come up with. And this rich young ruler goes away sad. He goes away grieving. And Mark is even more descriptive. If you know the gospel writer Mark, he loves to put beautiful little details in. When all the other gospel writers say that there was grass, Mark will come and he'll say the grass was green. He just gives us this color. And so as we look at Mark's account, he puts in a little detail and he's even more descriptive that when the rich young ruler goes away, we read the man's face fell. His face fell, it's a, it's a kind of a, a, a Greek idiom of this dark thunder clouds going in front of the sun. It was the, this man's face when he heard what he's gonna hear from Jesus and we'll unpack it in a moment. It was as though these clouds were etched into his face and his face fell and he went away so sad. Because his entire life had been about getting to the top 
And he was almost at the top of the mountain and he recognizes that he's not maybe 100% sure whether he has eternal life. He senses Jesus is a wise man. He doesn't go to other gurus. He comes to Jesus and he wants Jesus to tell him, what is this last little final step that I need to take just so that I could be at the summit of the mountain? I've got it all together, but, but if I could just take this last step and I'm sure Jesus got the answer for me. For me. And you know what Jesus does? Jesus rips the mountain out from underneath his feet. And Jesus tells him that he's on the wrong mountain altogether. Imagine the tra tragedy of, of climbing the ladder of success only to find out when you get to the top of the ladder of success that your ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. Now I have a confession to make. I don't normally borrow uh, from other preachers but there's a sermon by Tim Keller that he preached more than two decades ago that has deeply moved and impacted me. And so I've taken many of his points and I've adapted them and made them my own, but I, I think Keller just has a way of unpacking this passage to hang these things on that I think will really be helpful for us th th this morning. Because there are four reasons why the rich young ruler went away grieving. Four reasons why he went away sad. Number one, he went away grieving because he talked to the real Jesus. And whenever you talk to the real Jesus, you will get the real truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And if the God that you worship this morning only ever tells you what you wanna hear, small g God, then the chances are that your God, small g God, is probably just a projection of yourself, it's an idol. And so we need to be careful of, 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 of preachers who only tickle our ears, who only tell us what we wanna hear, of a God who never rocks our world, who never disturbs us, because when you meet the real Jesus, you will always leave disturbed and unsettled in some way. And that is because Jesus always demands far more than you ever thought, but he also offers you far more than you ever dreamed. And there's those things, as you hear the word of God preached, Jesus always demands more than you ever ever thought, and he also offers more than you ever dreamed. And so when the real Jesus speaks real truth, there's only one of two responses. Either you can fall to your knees, you can fall on your face in worship, and you can say, Lord, this is the truth. This is what I've been looking for. This is what I haven't heard elsewhere. Or, like this man, you can go away offended, you can go away sad, grieving. But do you know that even if you go away this morning offended and sad, there's still hope. And do you know why there's hope for somebody who goes away sad and offended? There's hope because they've heard the real deal. Maybe they'll mull over the truth and actually come back to Christ. And that's why we don't know. The scriptures don't tell us, did this man ever come back? I'm hoping secretly that one day I'm in heaven, I'm gonna see him and I'm gonna hear the story that's unrecorded. And he said, I went away and I thought about what Christ said and I actually came back and I did follow him but maybe that's idealistic on my part because I think what had him in the stronghold of wealth that had him probably had him so deep that maybe he never came back. But the one thing I do know is that when the real Jesus speaks, you cannot remain indifferent. Mark Twain once said, it ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me, it's the parts that I do understand. And I don't think Mark Twain was e even a Christian. I'm not sure where he stood spiritually. It's not those parts of the Bible that I do understand, uh, that, that I can't understand that bother me, all those complex things and the debates we wanna get into. You know what really bothers me? It's the parts that I do understand that are clear and patently obvious. Sure. So this man went away grieving because he met the real Jesus. But number two, he went away grieving because Jesus smashed two of his basic assumptions about how the gospel works, about how religion works. I think this man is like many of us today. We're here in church. We've come to hear from Christ. We've come for some kind of spiritual experience. This guy could have gone anywhere else, but he recognizes there's something about Jesus. And he's not quite sure if he's done enough to be in good standing with God, but his whole life has been about doing stuff, about, hey, give me a job, give me a to-do list. I'm the guy, I'll get it done. I'm about deliverables. And so he kind of comes to Jesus. Jesus, what must I do? What must I do to inherit eternal life? If you can just tell me what this last little step is, then, then, then Jesus, I'll do it. And he makes two faulty assumptions. Number one, that Christianity is something that you can just add to your life. It's just something you can just add to your life. And the second faulty assumption is that Christianity is just something you have to do. It's something you can do. 
So let's look at the first faulty assumption. Christianity is something you can just add to your life. When Jesus lists some of the Ten Commandments, and we read that as Jesus went through them, the rich young ruler says in verse 20, all these I have kept, what do I still lack? In fact, the other Gospels say, all of these I've kept since I was a boy. I mean, I've been doing this. This is part of the furniture. Give me something new. Give me a challenge. Give me something tough. I want another you know, mountain to climb. I mean, this is easy stuff. I've been doing it since I was a kid. And Jesus, if you can just tell me what the cherry on the top is, that's all I need. I've, I've built this mountain myself. I just, I just need this last little cherry. I can just add Christianity to my life. And this is what's so powerful about what Tim Keller says as he unpacks this passage. He says, Christianity is more like an explosion that completely decimates everything to make space for something new. That's what Christianity is. It's like an atom bomb going off that destroys your self-righteousness. Every mountain that you have built in your own strength that destroys that, which at first seems quite shocking, but it's to make way for something completely brand new. Remember Jesus with Nicodemus in John chapter three. Nicodemus also wants to know about eternal life and Jesus says to him, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus says, what, that's impossible. I've got to go back into my mother's womb and be recreated. Yes, that's what the gospel is. That's why impossible comes up in this passage. Surely this is impossible. Who then can be saved? Because Christianity is an explosion that must make way for something new. Christianity doesn't just add some nice pixie dust to your life and wave a magic wand and say a little bit of pixie dust of goodness, just add this little cherry on. Christianity is not some kind of nicotine patch that you just put over your heart just so that you can kind of, oh, now I'm a little bit more upright. I can control my cravings a bit better. Thank you, Lord, for this little nicotine patch. But I'm feeling a bit better now. Maybe I can take it off again. It's just part of me. Or, or Christianity is a hobby. I've got my gym contract. I've got my Netflix subscription. I've got my friend circle. I've got my whole lot of stuff. But at least for an hour and a half on a Sunday, Lord, uh, this is the part of life that you can deal with. And thank you. But then that's the sum total. Jesus is just a hobby. He's just part of our lives, something we add. But I think this passage tells us that Christianity is a total and complete rebirth. So his first assumption is that Christianity is just something you can add, and his second faulty assumption is that Christianity is something you can just do. He didn't realize that the law was there as a mirror to show him that he couldn't keep the law. But he in his arrogance said, ah, oh, there's laws? Great, I'll be able to do this. I'll be able to complete the Iron Man. Of course I can do it. And until we've seen our true condition, not just at external level, but at a heart level in the mirror of God's law, we won't know that we need a savior. He didn't realize how desperate he was for Jesus because he had it all together. So why did he need Jesus? Why did he need a savior? Paul writes to the Romans, talking about the purpose of God's law, the 10 commandments. Romans 3.19, Paul says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced. And the whole world held accountable to God. So Paul's saying, actually, when you've really studied God's law, the purpose is to silence your mouth, your boasts, your bragging, your accomplishments, where you want to justify yourself and say, of course I'm a good person, I'm not that bad. The law, if you correctly understand it, should make you go, Zip. and you should fall down and recognize that you're accountable to God. Romans 3.20, the next verse, Paul says, therefore, no one will be declared righteous. Did you hear that? No one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Because we all still have one thing that's lacking, even if we're as good as this guy was, there's always one thing lacking. And if we've broken God's law, even at one point, like a pane of glass, if it's broken in one place, the whole thing is broken. So no one can be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. That's why God gave it, so that we'd recognize we can't keep it, that we continually break it in numerous ways, big and small. And then Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians 3.24 and says, the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ. King James said the law is a schoolmaster. It shows us, but then it leads us to Christ. It's like, I've got to have Christ. I didn't realize how broken and sinful I am. And the law also makes us think things that we wouldn't have even thought before. Paul says that elsewhere in Romans. I don't know about you, but when a law goes up, I suddenly in my heart think, oh, how do I break that? I didn't even think about that law. How can I break that? Like when I was in the music museum in Paris, I mean, the stuff, I like to use the excuse that everything was in French, so I couldn't understand it. But this forerunner to the piano from 1414, which was standing there, I mean, it was chained off. There were lots of signs. 
I couldn't read them, but I just thought, they probably say don't touch. And so as the worship pastor of this church, I reached out my hand and I played a note on a piano from 1440 and that note signaled a whole cacophony of things that then went on. People came running, French people were shouting, sorty, 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 I didn't know what sorty was. And then I saw the doors where it says exit, it actually says sorty, and I was sent on my merry way out of that museum. I read a story about a, a hotel somewhere, uh, I think it was in Florida. They couldn't understand why all their guests kept fishing off the balconies, because there was this beautiful lake outside the front of the hotel, and people kept fishing off the balconies, but they had these heavy sinkers, but they would go down and smash these really expensive windows. This was a classy hotel. And you know what they did? They decided to take down the signs on all the balconies that said, please do not fish from the balcony. Because I don't know about you, I would have got out there on the balcony and thought, I've never even thought about fishing from the balcony. This is brilliant. Let's go and buy, I don't even like fishing, but fishing off a balcony is, is, is on steroids. Let's do this. They took the signs down and the incidences of people fishing from the balconies declined. Because that's what the law does. Paul says, I wouldn't have known what coveting was, but the law said, do not covet. And it actually created in me a desire to covet. That's what the law does. It exposes our sin and pushes us to Christ. So I think the law, the Ten Commandments, is a great way to share the gospel with people. Probably only around the turn of the century you thought, oh, the law, we don't want to deal with that. Let's just tell people about the benefits of Jesus and they'll come to Jesus. But when the benefits wear off, they're gone again. Throughout history, the law was the precursor. That's why even the way the Bible's described, you only get to Jesus when you kind of get to matrix, so to speak, in God's revelation. Because in kindergarten, you're learning about the law. Man, I'm a sinner. Oh, the sacrificial system. Who's gonna save me? Oh, I'm feeling the weight of my soul. And then Christ comes and we need him and we want him and we love him. So I say to people, would you consider yourself to be a good person if they've got spiritual questions? And you know what I hear? Maybe nine, nine and a half times out of 10. Yeah, I'm a pretty good person. I have the odd off day, but who doesn't? And then I say, well, how do we decide what's good? How does God know who he should let into heaven or who he shouldn't? Should we look at his 10 commandments? That's his standard. And then I'll list the same commandments we've just read using this passage as an example. Do not murder. Have you ever murdered anyone? No, that's an easy one. Never done that. Well, do you know that Jesus says in the New Testament says if you've harbored hatred towards a brother and you get so angry, is that not the seeds of murder in your heart? Do not commit adultery. Oh, that's easy. I've got a really good marriage. I haven't committed adultery. Jesus said, hey, I see the video in your mind. If you've ever lusted after a woman, you have committed adultery in your heart. Do not steal. Have you ever stolen anything, even when you were small? Time, money, anything? Oh, yeah, maybe a few small things. Well, what does that make you? Oh, well, I'm sure. Well, if you went to the bathroom and I just took two rand out of your wallet, doesn't that make me a thief? Isn't the amount irrelevant? How many times do you have to rape to be a rapist or murder to be a murderer? Only once. Do not give false testimony. Have you ever lied? So according to God's standard of goodness, would you be headed for heaven or he headed for hell? And you can see the weight, the weight of this burden as we begin to not just look at the externals, but internally we feel this weight. And we say, well, then who then can be saved? And that's the exact question that we should be asking because Christ comes in and, and he's gospel. But you know what the rich young ruler said after Jesus took him through these commandments? He said he'd kept all of them. He said he kept all, maybe he was being sincere, maybe he was only looking at a surface level, not at the heart at which I was talking about. But did you notice what Jesus does here? He only lists commandments from the second half of the 10 commandments, the Decalogue, as it's called in fancy terms. Only the commandments from the second half which have to do with people to people. Don't murder, don't steal. The things that are to do with people. And, of course, I've done that, I've done that. But Jesus wants to take him to the thing that's really missing, the first few commandments, which is about putting God first. And I think in a strange way, Christ is setting him up so that the law can expose him. And so Jesus says, I want you to do something that's impossible. Jesus wants to drop a bombshell that is gonna explode this man's assumptions about how religion works. In fact, he's told him up front, if you look at verse 17, that there's only one who's good, only one. There's only Christ, there is only God who's good. And so Jesus asks him to do what's impossible. Take all your wealth and sell it. Take all your wealth and sell it. And we say, what? And Jesus said to him, let's forget about all the other commandments. Let's just start with the first commandment of putting God first. Just because I'm Jesus, I wanna tell you, sell everything. Will you do it? If I'm the Lord and I am God, then will you do it? 
How's he doing now? The explosion has gone off and his self-righteous heart has been ripped open. You see, if God is really first in your life, then everything else is just insignificant. Everything else is small change by comparison. Jesus is saying, my friend, the point is nobody loves God with all of their heart and soul and strength and mind. Nobody truly loves their neighbor as themselves. Even you, the fact that you're holding onto your money means you're not actually thinking about the poor and the disadvantaged. Your problem is not that you lead a little more goodness, a little bit of pixie dust just to make it to the top. Your problem is that you won't admit that deep, deep down you know. You know in your heart of hearts that you're not good. Maybe Jesus even knows, hey young man, that's why you even came to me today because you've been to the other gurus and rabbis and you're here today because I think deep down you know that you're not good. When Liesl and I and the girls were overseas on my sabbatical, we had the privilege of visiting Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum, which has all strange oddities and things like that. And there was a section of miniature sculptures that you can only see under a microscope. It's incredible. People had done the most intricate little sculptures that with the naked eye, you can't even see anything there. And there was one based on this passage of scripture. It was a needle, and in the eye of the needle was this minute camel, perfectly sculpted, perfectly painted. And this was all attached to microscopes. You look through the microscope and it just was incredible. But as I looked away from the microscope, I I looked at this needle and to the naked eye, it looks straight, it looks shiny, it looks spotless. I mean, it just looks so smooth. And then when you come back to the microscope and you look at this needle, you realize that actually it's not straight, it's dented, it's got pock marks, it's actually slightly skew. And that's the reality, if you truly get up close to the people that you know in your life, if you really get up close to your own heart, if you really got up close to a human heart, you would see brokenness, you would see dents, you would see that things are are not quite where they should be, they're crooked. So Christianity is not something you add. Christianity is not something that you just do, it's something that you receive. And friends, that's the good news. That is the good news this morning. You come to God on the basis, not of what you've done, but on the basis of what he has done. Not with your accomplishments, but with his accomplishments through the cross. So yes, that's maybe painful if you've got this mountain of good works and now they're demolished, but it's also good news on this side if you say, but I'll never be like those people. I, I mean, my good works are here. If you knew my past, both of you can come because both need to realize that it's not about what you have accomplished or what you have not accomplished, it's about Christ. So yes, compared to other men, yes, maybe this man is good. Maybe you compared to your neighbors are a little bit less dented and maybe not as crooked. But what about compared to God? His commandments, his law, his holiness, his beauty. Our friends, we all fall short. So yes, this man's maybe good compared to other people, but that's not his problem. He believes in the wrong doctrine of goodness. His doctrine of goodness is wrong. And he goes away grieving because Jesus has come and smashed his assumptions about how religion works. And then number three, he went away grieving because Jesus got personal. I don't know about you, but there's been quite a number of people I've chatted to over the years and they love to keep things academic. Maybe they've come with tough questions. Maybe they're critics of the faith. Maybe it's somebody's husband and I've uh, gone to the home and and he's he's widely read on all sorts of things and you can get into abstract discussions about religion and which one is right and who's this Jesus and did he really exist and who's the historical Jesus but the minute you come to God's law and maybe even what I shared, people's consciences get pricked when you bring it out of the abstract and you say, well, what about you? Where do you stand spiritually? People get defensive. And I think Jesus refused to keep the subject of eternal life a nice little theological discussion. He got personal. And here's a special detail that Mark again, Mark, that gospel writer who loves the little details, he gives us this detail in his account. Mark 10, 21. He writes and says, Jesus looked at him. He looked at the rich young ruler. Jesus looked at him and loved him. And loved him. Before Jesus speaks the truth to him, he looks through the smoke screen. He peels back his heart and he reads his heart. He looks past his face and what his face is showing, these clouds on the face, and he sees his heart. Jesus can see him wrestling and Jesus loves him. 
This is the only account I know of of somebody who's an unbeliever who is kind of even walking away from Jesus and we read that in such a moving way, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Because like a good doctor, Jesus knows. He's come to me. He's actually come for answers and like a good doctor, I've got some bad news for him, but if he can embrace the bad news, he'll take the cure of the good news and I need to give him, him an examination. I've got to put my finger on this part of him and it's, 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 it's gonna be painful. My friend, I know this is gonna hurt you, but there is a cancer in your life. It is destroying you. You've got to get rid of all your money. Now, as a preacher, the last thing I wanna do is take the sting out of what Jesus is saying. But I do wanna give some perspective that this is the only place in the scriptures that we ever read of Jesus or God asking someone to give away all their money. I don't think this is a blanket rule. But I wanna take the teeth out of it because you may be exactly like this man. You might think that you've got wealth when in fact wealth has you. And I think we probably all in this room are far more wealthy than most people on planet Earth if we add up the average income of eight billion people. But I do want you to see as well that Jesus is doing something radical with this man. He's doing something that you would do with an addict or with a gambler or with somebody who is an alcoholic. What Jesus is saying is that the real difficulty in your soul is a power struggle with God over your dreams, over your dreams, over the thing that you really, really, really want more than anything else, more than even God. Remember the Old Testament? God comes to Abraham. Abraham, will you give me your one and only son? Offer him up. Jesus comes to the rich young ruler and says, will you give me your wealth, all your money? What's he doing? He's saying, give me your dreams. Surrender your life, surrender all your dreams. I want the most important thing that is in your life this morning. That thing is a cancer. I know you can't see it, I know you think it's neutral. I want you to surrender the thing that you dream of will give you life and meaning and purpose and joy and control. Those things without me. It's a monster, it's a cancer. All the things that you are clinging to, this will give me control, this will give me wealth, this will give me life, this will give me joy, this will give me a buzz, this will give me a thrill, this will give me success. All of those things without me, it's gonna kill you. I want you to surrender your dreams. And until you've given it to me, it's gonna kill you. And Jesus looks at him and loves him because I think he sees into his heart this wrestle. He, he kind of wants to follow Christ, but he wants to follow his dream. And we feel that the man sees wealth and Jesus looks into his heart and sees a monster. I remember young 18-year-old Kim. And to protect her identity, let's call her Kim. Kim wanted so much to live for God. The amount of times I'd met with her and youth leaders had met with her, she wanted to live to God, for God and every time she felt guilty, she'd come back to church and then she'd be impacted by God's word and then there's this, this, just this tussle with a monster, this life of parting. I'm 18, I just wanna have fun, man. And, and just giving herself away to whatever boy would look at her, notice her, touch her, just thrill her with some sweet talk, just giving her life away to whoever would love her. And I think if the gospel writer Mark was here, he would have said Jesus looked at her and loved her. And man, my heart went out to her. My heart wrestled as her pastor. She couldn't live for Jesus and she couldn't live for this monster and it was ripping her apart and bringing her grief. And one night, her Facebook status read, had the night of my life. Had the night of my life. And when I read that, I thought, what does that mean? And do you know that by the very next morning, early hours of that morning, she'd already messaged me. I said, Justin, my life is going downhill. And this is the actual account. I kept it. I said, what's the matter, Kim? No, it's just going bad with parties and boys. I can't stop and I always commit such bad things that I keep on doing over and over again. So why does your status say you had the best night of your life? Are you feeling guilty now? Uh, nothing bad, seriously, just did two little things, but I know they're huge in God's eyes what I did wrong. I'm just very naughty lately and I must actually stop. My life is really bad and sometimes I just don't want to stop. That's incredibly profound that somebody could say, I actually don't want to stop. That might even be you. I said, hey, I appreciate your honesty. I know it's tough, but I can tell you that putting God first brings way more blessings in the end. Otherwise, you'll look back in five years' time and you'll be left with scars and consequences. Please know that I want God's best for you. If you don't listen to God's gentle whispers, he may have to allow you to hit rock bottom before you look up. And then she replied to me, okay, just, 
Thanks, appreciate what you said. Hopefully one day soon I'll come to my senses. Hopefully one day soon I'll come to my senses. That was the last message I've ever received from Kim. Because a few parties later, just a few parties later, within a few weeks, these two drunk guys had picked her up somewhere or she'd picked them up or who knows, and they just decided spontaneously at 3 a.m., let's go down to the vault. Who knows where they were going, what they were going to do. And this drunk driver, intoxicated, didn't even take the bend on the N1, and he just went straight off this embankment, and poor Kim went straight through the back windscreen up into the air and broke her neck. Right behind her, maybe this is God's grace following her right to the end, was an ambulance and paramedics who gave me all the details of, of what had happened. They were there to care for her. They got her airlifted to Sunning Hill Hospital. It was too late. It's probably one of the hardest things I've had to do in more than two decades of ministry was to drive through. I think I was on worship and I walked out, I handed the file to someone and I just said, find somebody to lead worship. I was just absolutely shattered and I went to Sunning Hill and I sat there with the family. My heart was shattered because I could see what the monster was doing. And the monster literally, in this case, took her life. But there's so many other innocent things that we think, oh, I've, got, I've, I've got years ahead of me. I mean, what a dramatic story. That's not gonna happen to me. Well, Jesus looked at this man wrestling with wealth and he loved him. And Jesus says to you, you think this thing will give you meaning and control without God? It won't, we have to kill this thing together this morning. The reason your life is out of control is because you won't give control to me. You're afraid of losing control to God, give it to me and I'll decide how much money you have. Put me first, be willing to part with anything, cut the umbilical cord, turn to me and let me decide how rich you're gonna be. Anything can be a monster, yes money, sex, fame, popularity, accomplishments, trophies, love. Anything can take the place of Jesus, even good things. It's the thing that's your fondest dream, the thing that you say, I really want this. And it becomes more consuming than God. We think our problem is a behavioral problem. Jesus looks into our heart and he says, you have a monster. Surrender your dreams. David Foster Wallace was an American author who committed suicide and ended his life in 2008, aged 46 as I am today, same age as me. I don't think he followed Christ, but he gave this commencement speech to students at Kenyon College, and there were some incredibly profound things he said as somebody wrestling with whether he should even end his own life. This is what he said. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. If you worship money and things, then you'll never have enough. Never feel you have enough, it's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure and you'll always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power. You will feel weak and afraid and you'll need ever more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart and you'll end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. Yes, you lack one thing, Jesus says to this man, but it's not what he thinks. It's not the giving away of his money. The thing that he lacks is treasures in heaven. And that's my fourth and final point. He went away grieving because he didn't understand treasures in heaven. Jesus said, go sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. He missed it. He missed the fact that you have to get rid of the monster, that you have to sell your possessions in order to get the treasures of heaven. And Paul says the same in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17. I think the text is on the bulletin. Come on, those who are rich in this present world, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. You see, we can truly enjoy these things when God is first in his rightful place, because we don't need to suck the life out of them, they don't have to be God to us. God is God to us, and then we can truly enjoy what he has given us. So briefly, treasure in heaven means two final things that I trust will really challenge and encourage you. Treasure in heaven means seeing that Jesus is your treasure. 
I think Jesus is saying to this man, I want you to see that if you have me, you're rich. Young man, I know you have great wealth, I know you've got a, a great house around town, I know people look at you, but if you have me, you have everything. What you have is nothing compared to forgiveness. It is nothing compared to my righteousness. It is nothing compared to being adopted into the family of God. It's nothing compared to what I can give you. And don't you see what you are holding on to is not permanent. Thieves can break in and steal your wealth. Moths can come and completely eat it up. Rust can come and destroy it and corrupt it. What I offer you is permanent. I alone am good and as your savior, if you rely on me, you will find that I clothe you in my righteousness. You become good in me. The goodness you're looking for can only be found in me and you will see that I am your treasure. I am your righteousness. I am your joy. As Conrad read, I am your way. I am your truth. I am your life. I'm your record before God. And if you have me, then it changes your attitude towards everything else. Everything else is small change. Money is no longer an object worthy of worship. It's like, what is this money? It's seen in its right, right, compared to Jesus. He is the treasure in heaven. And if you worship me, you are free from the love of money and the worry of money and the envy that comes from money, and you're free to be generous. So treasure in heaven means seeing that Jesus is your treasure in heaven. And then secondly, Treasure in heaven means you have to see that you are his treasure in heaven. And I want you to just try and get your head around this, that you are his treasure in heaven if you've trusted Christ. You know, when Jesus sends the disciples out on that missions trip, I don't know if you remember, they come back and what do they report? They're jumping up and down. The demons have even submitted to us. We've been casting out demons in your name. Lord, this is incredible. I mean, the power. uh, And Jesus says to him, Don't rejoice that the spirits are submitting to you. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven, but where are our names written in heaven? Well, in the Old Testament, the high priest had the names of the tribes of Israel engraved into his breastplate. And so when he went into the Holy of Holies in the temple, on his breastplate, over his heart, were the names of the tribes of Israel. But we know from the New Testament that Jesus has replaced that priest. He is the great high priest. And in the Old Testament, we read in Isaiah 49, can a mother forget the baby at her breast? Though she may forget you, I'll not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. That's what your name is today if you are a Christ follower. Your name in heaven is engraved in the palm of Christ. Why on his palm? Some of you here this morning have tattoos and if you have it on your shoulder, maybe it's not always visible. On the, uh, the back here, maybe not visible. Maybe here, not always visible. But here, it's patently obvious. Jesus wants the world to know that you are here. And if he is your treasure, you know what? You are his treasure in heaven. It is incredible that God looks at you and he sees Christ. He sees beauty where you say, but, I, but my life is a mess, I only see ashes. God sees beauty. He sees joy where you see pain. He sees you radiant in Christ, beautiful in Christ, clothed in Christ, righteous in Christ. He dotes on you. And I know what that's like as a father. Last year, I doted on my daughters. As the daughter of the elder went off to her matric dance, I stood back, it's just like, wow. And daughter of the younger went to her dev's ball. Wow, that's what a father does. He, he has his breath stopped as, as, as he dotes on those that he loves. And the Father dotes on you because your name is engraved here. It's engraved on his hand. Do you live in daily awareness of this? Or do you take your identity from the number of Facebook likes you've got or your weight on the scale or the trophies in your cabinet or the size of your bank account? Is this not the most exhilarating thought that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords looks upon you and dotes on you because you are his treasure. Don't you see the freedom that comes? Jesus says, you will be free if you realize that only with me you're truly rich. So friend, come to Christ today. I don't know where you stand spiritually. Come to Christ today, even if you have been offended, even if you are grieved by what he demands from you, come to him because you know what? When you come to him, you will see that he really, really loves you. He really loves you. Let's pray together. Oh Lord Jesus, your love, even for those that would walk away, Lord, your love for those that are trapped in sin, 
like an addiction, they cannot let it go. Oh Lord, the times that we go back to the filth again and again, Lord, I think of that proverb that says, as a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool returns to its folly. And Lord, we keep going back. And we keep saying, oh, this is terrible, why am I, and then we keep going back. And you look at us and you love us and you see and desire for us to treasure you above everything. You've said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added to you as well. Lord, may we not enjoy things above you. May you be our greatest joy. May you be our treasure in heaven. May we recognize that we store up treasures in heaven. That Lord, in a strange way, if we really wanted to be greedy, we'd be storing up treasures in heaven, not on earth. That is just crazy. And yet we don't because we're actually in some sense not greedy enough, not covetous enough for your love to experience you, to know the joy that comes from obeying you and worshiping you. Oh Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts this morning that where we have great wealth, in fact, Lord, where great wealth has us, that we would reflect on these things, that we would reflect on whatever it is that has us in its grip and recognize that you are above and beyond. Thank you for this timely reminder that you have not forgotten us and that, Lord, you will engrave us on the palm of your hands if we come to you, if we follow you, if we repent of our sins and put our faith and trust in the only hope that there is, the only true joy, the living water, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray this in your name. Amen.